welcome everybody to the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce's 2021, I almost said 2020, Rita, candidate forum for Georgetown ISD Board of Trustees and Georgetown City Council. Uh, you're hearing my voice online. My name is Jim Johnson. I am the president and CEO of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber's mission is to facilitate economic success for our community through advocacy, education, and collaboration. Today's forum is designed to educate our members, the business community, and general citizens on candidates running for office and their positions on topics that have been selected by the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce's governmental affairs team. Today's event is a forum not a debate and the candidates will each answer the same questions uh, in a pre-selected order at this point i will introduce our moderator for this evening our moderator is miss rita healy general manager with the sheridan austin georgetown hotel and conference center board member with the georgetown chamber of commerce 2019 board chair and current committee chair for the chamber's governmental affairs committee thank you rita for being here and thank you for moderating my pleasure jim and thank you for always getting it right <laughs> it's a mouthful um good evening everyone and good evening gentlemen um we're going to rotate the questions so um, each of you will answer the same question but i'll rotate who starts and so i'll i'll just call on each of you as we go but um you can kind of keep track in your own mind and if i get mixed up and get the order wrong somebody just raised their hand i i take direction pretty well so we're going to start with steven good evening um first question is what is your vision oh i'm sorry opening remarks there we go see how well i take direction well, let's see if the microphone works. Jim, are you pleased with that? Okay. Um, we have a saying in Georgetown that uh, if you've lived here 20 years, you're old Georgetown. Well, I'm ancient Georgetown. I got here when I was six weeks old. Um, I come from a family that uh, has long been involved in the school district. My father was on the school board 55 years ago when we desegregated the schools. My wife was on the school board for 12 years between 1989 and 2001. Uh, but I have never uh, given any time for public service. And I decided uh, that it was time for me to do what I was trained to do. And that is to give some of my time uh, to serve uh, for public service. And I decided to do it on the school board but what really led me to pick now um, was the fact that I tutor at uh, Pearl Elementary and I have tutored at Williams and Pearl for five years before the COVID uh, epidemic. And so I, I became very involved with the children and I became very aware uh, that there were some educational problems, but I just attributed it to the fact that um, children that have disadvantages when they come to learning are going to have problems with learning. Uh, but as the test scores were reported and the ratings were reported, I became more and more concerned. And finally, I decided that it was my time to step up and see if I could do something about it. Test, test. All right. Yeah, I'll go ahead and start over. Hello, everybody. My name is Jeff Sigismund. I grew up in Austin, Texas, went to Lubbock, Texas to attend Texas Tech University, where I graduated with an accounting degree and a minor in mathematics. I moved back to Austin and started working with a company called National Instruments as a staff accountant, spent seven years there, and now I currently work for Electronic Arts as a business planning lead. I also have never thought about running for public office. Uh, I am a, a new father to a two and a half year old daughter. And after the attack on the Capitol on January 6th, I sat there watching it, wondering what went wrong in these people's lives to bring them to this spot. And my thoughts are, 
it made me realize that I could do a lot more than I was currently doing. So I decided to put my name in the hat and try to make the effect on where I think we can make the most impact is our children. So um, have, having a daughter who will be a future GISD student, I want to make sure that GISD is, is the place to be for all students, including my daughter. So thank you for having me and I uh, look forward to talking more. Mic check. Is it good? Everybody, okay, perfect. So uh, I'm Ben Stewart. It's uh, nice to be here tonight. Thank you guys for coming out and taking uh, your time this evening to listen to us. Uh, a little bit of my background. I've uh, moved to Georgetown about nine years ago. I have a wife. I've been married to her name, Sarah. We've been married for 19 years now uh, and two daughters in the district. Uh, we moved here again nine years ago and we put our oldest daughter in the district eight years ago. They started out uh, at Carver. And I've got one in Wagner Middle School now and my youngest is still at Carver. So uh, for the last, I guess, eight years, I've been involved in the district, uh, starting out as a PTA dad, uh, worked my way up uh, into watchdogs, and then uh, ran treasury for the PTA. Uh, after that, for two years, I moved to a presidency of the PTA, and then I got involved at the district level with a citizens advisory committee. I don't know if anybody in the room right now is on that committee, but if you are, thank you for that work. It is hugely important to what we do in the district. Uh, so uh, after citizens advisory committee, I was appointed to the board. Uh, for the unexpired term for Rona Johnson. Uh, after that, I had to run again and was uh, elected to the board uh, one more time. And now I'm running for my third term on, uh, on the board. So happy that you guys are here and really hope that you'll vote for me. But I guess uh, the, the question I get most often when we're talking to community members is why do you do this? What, what about it? What do you, why? And I had to you know, really reflect a lot on my life. And I think looking back at my life, I came from a, a single parent home uh, I had lots of trouble uh, when I got into high school uh, with grades and, you know, things that you know, happen when you, in my opinion, you know, not having a dad around. It really affected me in school. So uh, really care about social emotional wellness of kids, trying to understand, you know, what makes them tick? How do you engage them? How do you get them to learn in a district? Uh, kind of like Dr. Benol was saying, you know, some of these kids are coming to school with issues that you could never even imagine. I know, I, I mean, some things I've seen since I've been on the board just, you know, struck me as, uh, you know, made me think that my life was a cakewalk compared to them. So uh, truly uh, looking to uh, develop more programs that give kids uh, life skills through college, career, military readiness, and uh, all sorts of uh, other great programs that we have here in the district. So uh, happy to answer any questions you guys have tonight. And again, thank you so much for showing up. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, fantastic introductions. Um, so now we'll go back to uh, Stephen with our first question. No, we're gonna we're gonna start there because that's the way my notes are, and we don't want to mess that up. <laughs> I appreciate that. What is your vision for Georgetown ISD, Stephen, and how can you help shape this as a trustee? I have an immediate vision and a long-term vision. My immediate vision is I want to get our DNF rated schools up to being A and B rated schools. I think this is critical uh, for several reasons, uh, largely because there are po potential sanctions from the Texas Education Agency if we don't get this fixed pretty soon. And then I think that those ratings are hurting the reputation of the school district and the sooner we fix that, the better. But my long-term vision is particularly uh, toward elementary age kids that they learn the basic academic skills of reading, writing, and arithmetic, because that's the foundation. And without the foundation, the superstructure will fail. Thank you, Stephen. Jeff, would you like me to uh, repeat the question for you? What is your vision for Georgetown ISD and how can you help shape this as a trustee? So uh, my immediate vision for Georgetown ISD is to emerge from this pandemic as a state leader. Um, currently, as Dr. Benold mentioned, our accountability ratings are not the best and actually one of the lowest in Williamson County. So uh, we really need to uh, pick up the pace and have a sense of urgency on the board to figure out what exactly is causing these scores to be so low. I think my, my expertise in finance can help the board 
basically rebuild the budget for what education looks like post pandemic. Um, a lot of the money that was spent on ways we educated kids before this pandemic is going to be completely different once everybody returns to school. So I believe that uh, as a new voice with new ideas and a strong accounting and finance background, I'm in a perfect position to lead Georgetown ISD out of this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Ben? Perfect. All right. So I think uh, vision for the district, I agree with what these gentlemen are saying. I know uh, A through F ratings have been hard on everybody, but uh, truly with my experience in the schools, if you, uh, you know, were involved in the schools, uh, you would see that those accountability ratings are flawed. And I definitely uh, having those grades better, nobody in GISD wants to see A's or D's or F's tagged on our schools. But I think uh, explaining to the district and explaining to people where those grades come from and what they actually mean, and then talking about the things that we're doing in our district, uh, building airplanes, building uh, trailers. I mean, all these th things that uh, engage kids and get kids to, to learn and to do better uh, are the things that we need to continue working on and continue uh, spending our time and effort on. They're right, engaging kids in that way will make them better students and those scores will naturally come up. Thank you very much. Um, second question, <clears throat> excuse me, goes to you first, Jeff. And it is actually a question that came in prior to um, the forum tonight from an audience member. As a local business owner, we're dependent on the local market and therefore the local school districts to educate and prepare our future employees. Be it technical training or general education, preparedness for the workplace or further education is crucial, crucial for lifelong success. What is GS, uh, GISD doing now to measure the degree of graduate preparedness for the high school to work or high school to college transition in the years after leaving GISD? Thank you. So, uh, as Ben mentioned, the College Career and Military Readiness Program that is currently at GISD is doing a great job to prepare kids who aren't ready to just go to college. College is not for everybody, but it's the district's job to help every student get ready for their next step in life. I think that in terms of the, the business owners in the community, they are there to welcome Georgetown graduates into the community and their workplaces. So as a district board member, it is definitely our responsibility to put those policies in place that prepare these kids for their next step in life and to enter to into our businesses in the community. Uh, Ben, you answer the question next, and I'll just repeat the question part of it. Um, what is GISD doing now to measure the degree of graduate preparedness for the high school to work or high school to college transition in the years after leaving GISD? So about uh, two years ago, we challenged the staff in the district to look at college career military readiness as a, a metric that we say 100% of our students should graduate with one of those pathways. So uh, year, uh, it's probably three or four months ago now, uh, we've uh, released metrics on that and showing the growth that we've made in that. So we've got, you know, empirical evidence on how we're preparing those kids to enter, uh, enter the workforce or go to college. So, I mean, it's, if you guys have not been to state of the district, you need to come check that out. That is a true showcase of what GISD is preparing these kids for. And anybody in the community that owns a business that would come there would actively tell more business to come here and see the product that we're producing in GISD. And finally to you, Stephen. What is GISD doing now to measure the degree of graduate preparedness for the high school to work or high school to college transition in the years after leaving GISD? I'm not sure exactly if anyone is measuring anything as to how well prepared our graduates are. I think a real good suggestion would be to simply survey the graduates after they've graduated and ask them how they've done. And I think that would be as applicable to somebody that's gone into the military, someone that's gone directly into the workplace, or since the question was particularly about academic preparation for college, uh, survey the college students and ask them how well they were prepared to, to do in college. Uh, I think that would be uh, very beneficial. Thank you very much. Uh, ben, the next question comes to you first. Elected trustees are part of what's called the Team 8. 
This refers to the concept of trustees working with the superintendent to implement policy. What makes you uniquely qualified to help the trustees achieve the district's direction from a team perspective? Perfect. So uh, I, I come from a, um, a technical background in business and uh, my day to day job is in consulting with, you know, Fortune 500 companies. So I use uh, analytical decision making tools and analysis and processes to uh, take business leaders and organize their objectives into uh, technical solutions. So using that same kind of concept, a consulting mindset, a strategic mindset, uh, looking at the district helps me ask the hard questions. And again, uh, my personal background, I come from, you know, a single parent family, uh, come from, I was a high school dropout that went back and graduated. So I've got a, a perspective on this that most people don't. So uh, I like to look at it from my life experience lens and I use that uh, to help the board, you know, think about things that they may not have thought about from my own personal experiences. Thank you. We go back to Stephen. What makes you uniquely qualified to help the trustees achieve the district's direction from a team perspective? I guess the main thing is my experience being on boards. I've been on multiple, multiple nonprofit boards, including the Boys and Girls Club, uh, the Caring Place, the Georgetown Brain Study. Uh, many boards and I've served as the president on many of those boards and so I am very used to working with boards but I think as a new member of the school board uh, it's going to be up to me to help integrate myself with the experienced members and I think that I'm going to have to spend some time carefully listening uh, to their points of view and I'm going to have to be open uh, to uh, negotiating and coming to compromise so that we can come to solutions. Um, I think this is essential if we're going to have a team. Thank you very much. Jeff, just one more time, the question for you, what makes you uniquely qualified to help the trustees achieve the district's direction from a team perspective? So uh, my entire life, I have always emerged as a natural leader, whether it be in sports or in my professional career. I've never been one to be reluctant to voice my opinions and work together as a team to achieve a shared goal. I believe that the board is a lot similar to a jury. So a jury is a group of peers who are there to work together, not individually, to come up with a solution. So. I really don't believe there's anything that prepares you to serve on a school board. I think it's very unique. And the juries that I've been on, when we go to deliberate, I, of course, voice my opinion. And usually the group buys in. I'm there to explain any calculations I might have. Um, but I believe that, you know, working together to achieve a common goal is how we're going to lead this board. Thank you very much. Um, Stephen, I'm going to go back to you with the next question, and I'm taking a little bit of liberty here. I, I apologize if I offend anyone, but I'm going to combine some questions from the audience here tonight about um, the STAR test. Um, what is your philosophy or vision on STAR as a metric for district success? Do you think it should be continued? And if so, what specific steps would you take to raise those ratings? I think the STAR is not a matter of should it continue. It will continue because it's mandated by the state of Texas. And I think that the STAR test is a very good test for what it tests. It tests the Texas education, no, educational knowledge skills. Uh, if you know what the state of Texas wants you to know in their learning objectives, then you will do well on the test. If something else is being taught other than the Texas educational skills, well, then you won't do well on the STAR test because the STAR test is geared uh, purely to that. Uh, sometimes the STAR test gives us data that doesn't look very good. Um, frankly, I, as men go, am short. But because I'm short, and maybe I don't really like it, but I don't blame the yardstick. Okay, the question goes to Jeff. Your philosophy or vision on the STAR test as a metric for district success, should it be continued? And if so, what steps would you take to meet a goal of raising the ratings for our school? So uh, nobody likes taking a test, but it, it's 
prevalent through our entire life. You start with the STAR test, you take the SAT to get into college. If you want to be a lawyer, you take a test, a doctor, you take a test. So it's not about trying to get us not to take tests. It's about figuring out what exactly is causing our students to test so low. I think an investment in technology, infrastructure, and just additional curriculum that ties directly to what the state wants kids to be able to do. I think the state curriculum is not the only input, but it's an important one if we are going to be given money based on how well our kids are testing. Ben, what is your philosophy or vision on the STAR test as a metric for district success? Should it continue? And um, what steps would you take to meet a goal of raising the scores? The STAR test, plain and simple, is a test that was designed for statistical analysis. It needs to be not used as a, a punitive tool in our system. Kids fear it, teachers fear it. I've not talked to a professional teacher that, you know, that's their profession in life that says that the way we're using this is a good idea. I don't disagree with the use of STAR test, but if we use the STAR test as a diagnostic tool to say, kids are down here, let's look at why they're down here and not say that the district is failing because they're down here makes a lot more sense. So I think there, you know, we have to take it as Dr. Benold said, it's state mandated, but I think we need to lobby the state in the way that we use the exam. It's not, it's a diagnostic test. It shouldn't be punitive to our district. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think this will be our final question and it goes to Jeff first. As Georgetown ISD continues to grow, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing the school district? So Georgetown ISD is experiencing exponential growth. I actually live in one of the neighborhoods that is building 500 plus homes in the next year. I believe that as Georgetown grows, so will the ability for our teachers to communicate exactly what the kids need to learn and in relation to the previous tests, help them score better on state mandated tests. As we grow, we're obviously gonna need more money to invest in new schools, new infrastructure. And if our, our budget is based on state testing, we need to make sure that the first dollars we get go into figuring out how we increase those test scores. Thank you. Uh, ben, <clears throat> excuse me, as Georgetown ISD continues to grow, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing the school district? I think it's just, again, we serve currently about 12,000 kids. Each one of those kids is unique to themselves and trying to find a way to engage every individual kid is always a challenge. So continued focus on, uh, you know, things that help us engage with that kid and make them excel. And again, you know, looking at ways to modify the way we're using STAR tests so that they're you know, teachers and children aren't scared to take a test. It's, you know, uh, more kids means more uh, diversity in, in the classrooms, more diversity in the school system. And that's you know, it's very, very challenging to keep up with when we try to put a standardized test across all of these unique individuals. So I think uh, just dealing with uh, all the uniqueness that uh, comes with the expansion and the growth in, in the county or in the community, or I guess county as well. So we're growing fast. And finally to you, Stephen, as Georgetown ISD continues to grow, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing the school district? Uh, I think uh, biggest might be building all the schools necessary for all those people. But I think the most difficult challenge is not that. I think the most difficult challenge is going to be teaching in first, second, and third grade the basic knowledge skills of reading, writing, and math because if that foundation is not laid, then future education is probably not going to be successful. Excellent. That, okay. Um, we have one minute of closing comments. And since Ben did not get a final question to go first, Ben will go first with you for your final minute closing comments. Perfect. I just, again, I want to thank uh, everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, this is more important than you know. Uh, about less than 4,000 people typically decide this race in May. So I encourage you guys to all get out and vote. Uh, ben Stewart, Place 7, currently incumbent, and I would appreciate uh, continuing my work on the school board. Thank you. I would just like to say that 
I am very passionate about the education, particularly of elementary school uh, of children. Uh, I think that our career uh, and um, military and vocational school is very important. I have always been supportive of that. But the reality is that doesn't start until high school. And most people will tell you that even for manufacturing work, the minimum today with the technology that we use is an eighth grade level of reading, writing, and math. And if we don't get that foundation done in the early years, and we're not getting it done right now, that's why we have failing elementary schools and middle schools, and I want to help change that. All right, thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Really appreciate it. Having a, a young daughter, I'm highly invested in the future success of Georgetown ISD. I believe that I can be a voice for all children in the district, no matter where they come from. And I believe that in urgent professional business person's mind on the school board with new ideas is exactly what this district needs. Thank you again. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, so we'll start, of course, with your two minute introduction and we'll start with Tim. Yeah, thank you so much. And most importantly, thank you to the crowd in the room. I know the folks online can't see it, but we have a great crowd here and it is fantastic to see the passion for the school board race this year. My name is Tim Carr. I'm running for Georgetown ISD school board place six, and I am really excited to be here. You know, a little background about me. I have spent the last 17 years in a senior leadership position in technology. Um, I have an amazing wife, Haley, and two beautiful kids. Uh, my younger son, Brody, who is 10. My older son, uh, Landon, who is 12, both in GISD, one at Ford and one at Benold. You know, I like, I think every candidate get the question all the time, why? Why are you doing this, Tim? And I'll tell you a quick story. I know we're on a time limit, but I was um, afforded the opportunity a few years ago to go to the um, Georgetown State of the District. And we specifically moved to Georgetown for my kids to get an education in a district they could spend kindergarten through high school and graduate as proud um, Georgetown Eagles. And I got the opportunity to look at the amazing programs that Georgetown has from the welding team to the culinary team, to the cosmetology team, to the robotics team, these incredible automotive team. We have kids in the district that build an airplane every year and get it certified to fly and sell it to fund that program. And as a parent in this district, that is exactly what I want my kids focused on is finding their passion, be invested in their education and finding what makes them excited to go to school every day. So with that, thank you very much. Sounds like it's on, Tim. Is it on? Is it on? Testing? Okay, great. Okay, thank you. My name is Jen Malden and my husband and I, Stan, moved to Georgetown in 1998 when I was hired as the principal of Carver Elementary and then was asked to open Joanne Ford in 2003. In 2013, I retired and opened up a coaching and uh, consulting practice where I'm employed today. Um, I did not intend to return to education, but felt called when I realized the significant decline our district has experienced in the last five years. And I'm deeply concerned. I'm running on the platform of high academic achievement, meeting the needs of all students, no matter what those needs are, teacher compensation and retention, and maximizing the taxpayer's investment in our education. I do believe that the state mandated curriculum known as TEKS is well thought out and continuously updated in terms by the teachers. 
I believe that students' mastery of the TEKS objectives for each grade level is critically important to prevent those gaps in student learning as we move forward through the school district. While I do not believe in all the tenets of the state accountability system, I do see the necessity of state assessments, the STARS, so that teachers and parents can see which objectives are mastered by their child and which objectives need to be addressed. At the school and the district level, the STAR represents an overall view of student mastery and where need resources need to be re reallocated. Let me be clear, I do support a academic rigor of a state curriculum and career technology, fine arts, athletic programs, special education, and dyslexia. As I close, I do want you to know that the 15 years I've served in GISD as principal were the best years of my life. Thank you very much. No, you got to eat it. That's how, that's how they hear you. <laughs> okay, uh, first question then, and thank you both so much for those great introductions. First question is going to go to Tim. Um, you'll hear some of the similar questions that you heard, and, and I've got a couple of different questions uh, for you. First of all, Tim, what is your vision for Georgetown ISD? How can you help shape this as a trustee? Yeah, um, I'll also give you a, a very quick short-term, long-term vision. Short-term, I think it is absolutely imperative that we get our kids back in school 100% safely, but we need to assess these kids both from an academic standpoint, from a, a social-emotional standpoint next year, and put very clear learning paths together to ensure that they are set up to thrive next year. Long term, 100% of our kids graduate every year with either a college readiness, career readiness, or military readiness. As a parent of two kids in this district, I will tell you my kids are not failing. They struggle at times. They have areas of opportunity, but I want them to find their passion. I want them to get engaged with a program, and I want to make sure every kid in our district has that exact same opportunity. Thank you. Jen, what is your vision for Georgetown ISD? How can you help shape it as a trustee? My vision for Georgetown ISD is a district of excellence a district of high academic achievement that strives to meet the needs of all students. And by implementing such programs as special education, dyslexia, bilingual, English as a second language, career technology, fine arts, athletics, my voice as a trustee on matters of budget, goals and outcome and policies will reflect this vision of excellence that meets the needs of all students. Thank you. <clears throat> um, question goes to you next, Jen. Um, and these are questions from the audience. What are your top goals or your vision for addressing Hispanic or Mexican American and black history issues at the schools? That particularly falls under um, the equity uh, area. And I think it's really important that um, we are very much engaged with all populations within our school district. Um, when we look at our programs, I think it's extremely important that we disaggregate the data to make sure that all of our populations and all of our students, whether they be African American, Hispanic, white, Asian, whatever, that they be um, uh, achieving academically at a level that's comparable across the board. Um, I think that while February is usually designated as Black History Month, I think that that needs to be, um, that needs to be throughout the school year and that we embrace and encourage uh, cultural diversity throughout our school district. 
Tim, what are your top goals or your vision for addressing uh, Hispanic or Mexican American and black issues in our school district? I think it's critical for everyone to remember that every board member serves at the pleasure of our community. And that means that when we sit up here and have ideas, if we think we have it figured out, we're sorely mistaken. We have to engage the community more. We have to sit down with parents. We have to sit down with community leaders and we have to absorb what is important to them to address those issues and make sure that we are addressing it as a community, as a group of parents, we have a bunch of amazing students that have amazing ideas every day. And if we are not engaging our community and we are not taking the right steps with their feedback, the opinion of the board doesn't matter. It's the opinion of the community and the people that we serve every day that are the most important steps. So we have to focus on working with our community to ensure what's best for our students. Thank you. Um, Tim, what, as Georgetown ISD is continuing to grow, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing the school district? You know, I think for me, it's the, um, the narrative that we're failing. I think if we continue as a community to go out every day and preach that our star test results are horrible, that we have failing campuses, that we have kids that aren't succeeding, and we're not embracing the amazing things we're doing, that's a recipe to not have the right growth in this community. We have to come together as a community. We have to talk about the two young men that built these trailers um, in our ag mechanic department that hauled them all over the state of Texas and one north of $10,000 in scholarships. We have to talk about our swimming team that just was awarded multiple medals at the state UIL meet. And oh, by the way, several of them are going to Ivy League schools. We absolutely have to fix the star testing. We have six failing campuses and it's not okay. But we also have to talk about the positive things that this district is doing every day and it will drive people to this community. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. As Georgetown ISD continues to grow, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing the school district? I think the biggest challenge facing the school district and as the di district continues to grow is the underperformance of GISD students and mastering the state curriculum. On the 2019 state accountability assessment that's administered to all Texas school districts, GISD students scored below the students in region 13 and the state of Texas on over 90% of the items on that test. As the district has reported, unfortunately, 33% of our schools are rated a D or an F, and we have no A-rated schools. In comparison, in Round Rock, 50% of the schools are rated an A, and only 7% are rated a D or an F. It is imperative to our community. Yes, we need to talk about the good things that are happening in our community. But yes, it's imperative that GISC turn from this declining path back to the main role expected in Texas public schools of mastering the state curriculum known as the TEKS. Thank you, um, Jen. Your next question um, was the one that I posed earlier from the audience. Um, as a local business owner, we're dependent on the local market and therefore the local school districts to educate and prepare our future employees. Be it technical education or general education, preparedness for the workplace or further education is crucial for lifelong success. What is GISD doing now to measure the degree of graduate preparedness for this high school to work or high school to college transition in the years after leaving GISD? I think Georgetown is probably one of the strongest areas in Georgetown is the college career military readiness. Um, Georgetown is already uh, offering many pathways for advanced academics, different ways to earn college credit so that many students are walking into college with um, some of their hours already ready to go. They are, already, they are also providing a great deal of academic advising and student support to either go whatever direction they want to go, whether it's military, whether it's career, or whether it's college. 
Um, Georgetown also offers a wide range of the career technology, and, and Tim mentioned the trailers. That was amazing to see what these young men were able to do. Um, they offer courses and programs to teach technical knowledge and skills. And in addition, some opportunities through the community of uh, industry-based certification. So I think a lot of fine work has been done uh, in this area in GISD. Uh, Tim, I will just repeat the question portion of this for you. What is GISD, <clears throat> excuse me, doing now to measure the degree of graduate preparedness for high school to work or high school to college transition in the years after leaving GISD? Yeah, just a, a quick data point. When we measure accountability ratings, when the state measures accountability ratings at elementary and middle school levels, it's rated strictly off the STAR test. It is pass fail. When we get to the high school level, the high schools take into account our CCMR participation, how well we're doing there, our graduation rates, how well we're doing there, the STAR testing. It takes multiple data points to show how that campus is doing. By the way, both of those campuses are rated as a B. If you just looked at the community impact this last week, they came out with data where our um, school district graduated 96% of our students. The state average was 90. Our dropout rate is 0.5%. The state average is 2. So we are doing the right things to measure to ensure our kids are not only prepared to succeed when they graduate, regardless of what path they take, but they're prepared when they get there. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, next question goes to you first. Elected trustees are part of what is called the Team 8. This refers to the concept of trustees working with a superintendent to implement policy. What makes you uniquely qualified to help the trustees achieve the district's direction from a team perspective? You know, I've spent the last 17 of years of my career in technology senior leadership managing multiple hundreds of people in an organization. I can tell you one thing that works every time is collaboration, teamwork, and listening. We have to listen to each other. And I've built teams on this philosophy, I've been very successful doing it, and it's very similar at a school board. We have to collaborate. We have to listen. We have to understand that there's different, differing opinions, and with the right focus and the right conversation, we can come up with a plan that is best for these students. I highlighted it earlier, and I'm extremely passionate about it as well. We absolutely have to be transparent with the community. We have to get feedback. And it's not just that team of eight, it's the team of 70,000 or however many is in Georgetown that is critical to ensure we work well together. Thank you. Jen, what makes you uniquely qualified to help the trustees achieve the district's direction from a team eight perspective? Uh, with my extensive uh, background in education administration, I work closely with a range of superintendents and I understand the role and the challenges that that job holds, the superintendency holds. While every school board member brings unique challenges to the board, my experience in education allows me to read and evaluate data and provide expertise in evaluating goals and outcomes to understand the daily lives of students, teachers, and principals in a public school. To be able to have, I've had many years of working effectively with all parents to connect, and particularly in the role of a board member, in some cases to explain policies with regard to the district. Probably the last, the last piece that I think is so important is being able to have a background in order to, to have the questions to ask about a topic that's being discussed, which sometimes can be difficult in the field of education. Thank you, Jen. You'll start the final question um, that we have for you two tonight before your closing remarks. Um, Georgetown ISD's Citizens Advisory Committee, or CAC, is currently meeting to discuss the potential for a bond election. How would you evaluate the need and time of calling for a bond, and what is the role of a trustee in bond management? Okay. 
during my 25 years of serving as a principal, I was asked to open two new schools, one in the Houston area and one at Joanne Ford in Georgetown in 2003. For this reason, I am enjoying the background work of opening new schools by serving on the CAC myself and the potential and listening to the demographers report and also the financing and the bond capacity for the school district. The school board's role on the CAC is to study the recommendation of this committee and to call an election if a bond issue is appropriate. While I think it's important to keep up with the growth of our community in terms of school building structures, I am much more interested in the instructional program that is occurring inside the school rather than the building itself. It is critical that every school have the necessary staffing and instructional resources to meet the needs of the students in that community in which they serve. Tim, regarding the Citizens Advisory Committee and their uh, discussion about a potential bond election, how would you evaluate the need and time of calling for a bond and what is the role of a trustee in bond management? Yeah, so I also sit on the Citizen Advisory Committee and just to give everyone a quick breakdown, it is several members of the community that are tasked with working through the methodology of if we need the bond, looking at current infrastructure, really assessing the demographics and future of the district. In that process, I would argue that the board should have zero participation. It is a job of the Citizen Advisory Committee to put a package together and go to the board and either suggest a bond or suggest that we don't need a bond. With that, I think it is critically important that our board, although we're in difficult times, I think we can all agree that coming out of the pandemic this past year is challenging. We have to focus on the future. If you looked at the demographics report that was just presented um, this week at the school board, we're the second fastest growing city in the state of Texas, and we have to ensure that we have capacity for our kids moving forward. So it will be critical coming out of the Citizen Action Committee um, to make that right decision. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Uh, Jan, I'm going to go to you first for your one-minute closing remarks. Thank you. Okay. As an educator for over 30 years and 25 years as a principal and my current position as a consultant coach with leaders of nonprofit and educational institution, I think I bring a unique set of experience and skills to the GISD school board. I care deeply about the children and the families in this community, and I would love to represent them as a board member. Thank you, and thank you, Trent Chamber, for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Tim? Yeah, I want to close with, as a parent of 12 years and a parent of GISD students for the last seven years, I want to be very clear with stating our students are not failing. We have areas of opportunity. We can absolutely and we will approve on the STAR test. But I've been in the corporate world my whole life and we've never measured the success or failure of anyone on anything off of one data point. And we will not do that in the district. We will continue to strive to be better. We will fix the test scores. But most importantly, we will celebrate these kids every day that are doing amazing things and ensure that everyone knows that Georgetown ISD is a destination if they're moving to this great state of Texas. Thank you very much. Thank you both very much. Mary and Amanda, welcome. Um, as we did with the other candidates, we're going to give you each two minutes to do a short introduction, um, introduce yourselves to your audience. And again, these are our Georgetown City Council candidates for District 1. Good evening. Okay, let's go. Good evening. My name is Mary Calistro. Um, I am currently the incumbent or the city council, district one. Um, I uh, decided to run again because I am finishing up a term that uh, uh, Anna Eby vacated 
um, one year into her into her term. Um, I have deep roots here in in Georgetown. I would like to finish um, the work that I started, and um, I've learned so much. And I am uh, hoping that uh, the uh, voters in District One will uh, be with me again. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, first of all, um, I am Amanda Parr, and I am running for the city council seat in District 1. I first want to thank the chamber for having us tonight and for um, the people who've come out to, to listen tonight and, and submit questions. We appreciate your participation. So just to give you a little bit of background, so I grew up up the road in Waco, Texas. Um, my mother is a native Waconian, and my father is from West Texas. Um, I found myself following them um, to Texas Tech University. So I am a proud Red Raider. Um, I wear that very red and black. Um, I know that's not a popular color down here, but we'll get over it, right? Don't hold it against me. So um, I moved to Georgetown 12 years ago, and I've lived in District 1 all of those 12 years. I moved here when I accepted a position at Southwestern University as the Senior Director of Leadership Gifts. Um, and I grew up in a family whose parents taught, who my, with my parents taught me that service is important and that you give back to the community that you love with your time and your talents and your treasure. And I have done that here in Georgetown. I started my first year as a proud graduate of the Chamber's Leadership Georgetown class of 2010. Um, I jumped into many organizations and have volunteered in many nonprofits and on many civic boards. Um, I am currently the chair of the Historic and Architectural Review Commission, appointed by the city council and the mayor. Um, and I'm proud to serve in these roles. I think they have made me uniquely qualified to serve in this position. Um, and I do feel like that this is the next step for me to make even a greater impact here in Georgetown, and I'm ready to serve our district. Um, many people have asked me, well, why are you running? And the, the biggest answer that I have right now is, as I said, I've lived in the district the whole time I've lived here 12 years. And in those 12 years, I feel that there's been very little communication and engagement in this district from our district representative. Um, and that needs to change. And I'm ready to give District 1 back the voice that we deserve on City Council. Thank y'all. Great, thank you very much. Um, we'll dive right in, and as I did with the other candidates, I'll alternate who uh, goes first, but you'll each, each answer the same question. Uh, Mary, starting with you, what is your ideal vision for the future of economic development in Georgetown? Um, my ideal vision is that there be enough um, business types, uh, it, um, industrial, commercial, businesses that offer jobs um, that pay a living wage um, spread evenly throughout Georgetown um, and that those jobs be available um, for all and um, that we can um, I, I, uh, we can oh, sorry I lost my train of thought that we can all live here play here worship here um, which is I guess what anybody wants here in Georgetown. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda, what is your ideal vision for the future of economic development in Georgetown? Sure, thanks for the question. So my, my ideal vision respects the unique history and character of our city and preserves and protects its historic assets. I have a proven track record in historic preservation, I'm the past president of Preservation Georgetown, and as I said, the current chair of the Historic and Architecture Review Commission. And I believe that Georgetown has to be a place where every resident can live, can work, and can play if they so choose in Georgetown. But that requires that we attract high quality employers. And it also, we also have to have a mix of housing types that are attainable to all citizens. We have to allocate economic development dollars to both local small businesses. And as a co-founder of a local business myself, I'm committed to champion local small business. But we also have to ensure that we're giving businesses to our dollars to our larger businesses as well, to ensure that we have a variety of options for all of our citizens. And we also need to distribute the commercial build. So in District 1, we, you know, I represent the Southeast side. And unfortunately, right now, I don't feel that we have the amount of businesses that we need to make to fill the need for our citizens on that side of town. Thank you. Thank you very much. Amanda, the next question is going to come to you first. Okay. 
A council member, of course, is elected by the voters of their district, but each district has businesses who employ our citizens, provide sales tax for the city, and pay taxes. How do you envision balancing the interest of citizens in your district with the businesses in your district? Yeah, I think that's a tough question and one that I've grappled with. I think that, you know, if elected, you have to balance your district voters um, and their needs, but you also have to prioritize the needs of the community and the businesses in your district. So it is my personal objective to be open-minded, transparent, and accessible to all constituents in District 1, but also to the Georgetown community as a whole. Um, I do believe that you are elected to represent your district, but you represent the city of Georgetown. Um, and I will strive to always prioritize the needs of District 1, but also keep in mind our entire community. Thank you. Mary, how do you envision balancing the interests of citizens of your district with the businesses within your district? Well, um, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. I, I just came out of a uh, economic study with um, Michaela Dollar, who, um, because that was a question that I was asking, how is how are we going to bring in um, more, you know, businesses, ATBs, um, coffee shops, drive-through, Sonic, I don't know. Um, and so what they did was um, she invited me to this um, economic study that they did. And in that study, uh, we found that in, um, in our district, there's 20,000 people ranging from their, their uh, pay range is uh, uh, 80,000 to 113,000. So uh, looking at that, uh, bringing in what we can in, in the right time, uh, that is, you know, my, I guess, way that I could balance, you know, the interest of the citizens and the businesses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you for the first response, Mary. The city of Georgetown called a mobility bond. Based on the current information available, would you or did you support the call for the bond vote and why? Were there any projects you think that should have been added or removed? All right, thank you. Um, first question, the answer to the first question, yes. Why? Um, well, I, I felt that there were enough, um, we had enough res representation from, um, a committee was formed and each council member had a representative um, on this committee. Uh, so I, I just feel that what the, I guess the dialogue between this committee and bringing it back to the council, this process was fair and um, both the city and county uh, decided, you know, we were approached by the county to uh, get some work done in the county. And I drove out there on, on some county roads where there were 90 degree angles. And, uh, and it's a good partnership that um, the city and the county went into. I think it's a fair and it will be put to the voters here in May. Thank you. Amanda, um, based on the current information, would you have supported the call for a bond vote? Um, why? And were there any other projects that you think should have been added or removed? Sure. Thanks for the question. Um, first, I, you know, I hope that voters understand how important it is to come out and vote. Um, this is an important issue in our city, um, and I do believe that we all need to come out and, and be educated about the mobility bond and, and make the decision that, that we feel is best for our city. Um, so absolutely, I do support the call for the bond. Um, in this rapid time of growth, I believe it is forward thinking to be proactive versus with mobility versus reactive. Um, I also love the inclusion of investments in all of our transportation infrastructure. So that means sidewalks, bike lanes, like the inclusion of our Austin Avenue bridges. I think that's important. Um, and, you know, pedestrian safety measures as well. So I think, you know, the, the question is, you know, as Georgetown grows, you know, if not now, when? Um, and I, I agree that I think we have to be forward thinking um, and be, as I said, proactive and not reactive. You know, you hear a lot, well, if we don't build it, they won't come. Well, they're here and um, we, we need to be proactive about what we're doing. And so, yes, I support the mobility bond. Thank you. Thank you very much. A uh, question from the audience that I'm, I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit. District 1 um, has a large population of minority constituents. 
what's your plan for reaching the people of District 1? Thanks for that question. Um, I completely agree. Um, district 1, for those that don't know, um, has the only minority majority district in the city. Um, and I think that's important. Um, and I think we have to uplift the history and heritage of, of that part of the district. Um, and the easy answer is that, you know, what I'm already doing. So what I do every day in my job in Southwestern is, is meet people where they're at, um, ask the right questions, find out what their needs are, what their thoughts are, what their ideas are. And that's what I'm already doing now with the areas of the district that I'm not as familiar with. And to be completely honest, there are areas that I'm not as familiar with that aren't around my home. Um, and I need to get to know those, those parts of the district better. Um, and I will ensure that I will do that. As I said, it's my personal objective to be open-minded, transparent, and accessible to all in the district and to communicate with all in the district. I think right now we have a problem with there being even any communication in the district. And so that will change um, under my leadership. Um, and I will be sure that everyone is communicated with and that their thoughts, needs, and ideas are heard, and more importantly, acted upon at the city council level. Thank you. Okay, Mary, the question is, District 1 has a large population of minority constituents, and how do you plan to reach the people of your district? Um, I think I've already been doing that, you know, born and raised in, in Georgetown. Um, I live currently in my uh, paternal grandmother's home uh, in, in San Jose, which is 100%, uh, or let me take that back, 99% uh, Hispanic population. Um, people on Katy Lane speak Spanish. I have no problems communicating with them. Um, I, my my uh, childhood home was on West Street, uh, which is right behind the council chambers. So I, I feel that I am um, in the mix, you know, um, and I, I feel that, that the communication, you know, is a two-sided thing. I'm not gonna barge into somebody's, you know, space. Uh, if they have concerns, they've come to me um, through emails, phone calls, um, social media. Thank you. Mary, coming back to you with the next question, what do you believe is the biggest threat Georgetown faces and how do you plan to address the issue? Biggest threat. Um, well, uh, I think that the, the biggest threat to Georgetown is uh, rapid growth. And um, it's it's almost like we can't keep up. Um, it, I believe a more conscientious planning, a consideration to um, what's being built and where it's being built, um, and the people who are being affected where that build is, um, be it business or um, roads, um, and even uh, I guess homes. Uh, I believe that uh, if if we can take into consideration when we're planning um, other people, you know, who I guess make their uh, comments known that they're not pleased, um, just to find a way to uh, compromise. Thank you. Amanda, what do you believe is the biggest <clears throat> threat that Georgetown faces and how would you address the issue if elected? Sure. Well, there's no surprise here. Um, I think Mary and I agree on this, that uh, that is our growth. So managing our growth appropriately is our biggest threat. Um, for me, as our community grows, we need to be proactive and it's critical to plan for both the short and the long term. We have to create innovative solutions as we expand our water, our electricity, and we have to keep our citizens safe by supporting our first responders. I am a champion for first responders, um, and we have to continue to support them so that we can keep our city safe. Keys to managing growth, clear and consistent policies, fiscal responsibility, and respectful development that help maintain our small town charm. Um, and we have to also do that by providing the amenities and resources of larger cities, cities and we also have to be mindful that as we grow, we are not overlooking our most vulnerable residents. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, final question, and it will come to you first, um, Amanda. In January 2020, the Chamber of Commerce sent a letter to City Council in support of City Council adding downtown parking. Uh, it's a hot topic. Uh, the Chamber's board was indifferent on the location and encouraged Council to move forward with the addition of parking. As of March 2021, there's been no progress on additional parking structures in downtown. What's your solution for parking in downtown Georgetown? Sure, thanks for the question, and I do agree it's a hot topic. Um, so first and foremost, the need for public parking is imminent. Um, and I understand why our downtown business owners, our citizens and visitors to Georgetown are eager for a parking solution. Um, I am in favor of a well-designed, well-located parking option. Um, and I also believe that that should be ideally close to our core. Um, one side note from me is that I grew up with a handicapped parent. And so I know what it feels like to be with someone who uses aids. And I know what it's like to push a wheelchair. And so we need to be close to our core with parking if possible. So, so I would support it being close to our, to our core. Also, as a preservationist, it is important to me that we respect our design guidelines and our unified development code, and that a parking garage fit into the fabric of what downtown already is. But we absolutely need parking. The solution is not parking in our residential areas. And so again, I would support a well-designed, well-located parking garage. Thank you. Mary, question to you, of course, about downtown parking and um, what uh, what is your solution for parking in downtown Georgetown? Um, we we paid for a consultant. The city paid for a consultant to come out and do their study. Um, he was professional, and in my opinion, I mean, if we're talking fiscal responsibility, let's um, not waste the citizens' money and put it put the suggestions, the parking garage, in the suggestions of this study. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Um, I will give you each one minute now to just do your closing statements, and we'll start with Amanda. Well, again, thank you to the chamber for hosting this and thank you to, to our audience. I appreciate the questions. Um, and I'm happy to engage in any way that you would like uh, moving forward. You can look at my website, email, or my cell phone, give me a call. Um, that is what I'm good at is engaging. Um, and so I wanna engage with you. Um, I think it's time that, like I said before, that we give District 1 back the voice that we deserve. I'm a strong voice. I'm a community advocate. I'm a leader in our community. I'm a preservationist, which is important for District 1 as you know I feel that downtown and the overlay districts are our greatest assets um, and I am going to be a champion for preserving and protecting those assets as well as a champion for first responders and for managing our growth productively um, so moving forward um, I ask you to engage um, and if you are in district one um, I ask for your vote thank you very much well I want to thank everyone for coming out um, and for the chamber putting on this event. And I, um, I just wanted to comment a little bit about preservation. Um, it's not just about the buildings, it's about the quality of life, um, the people. Um, six generations, I, uh, I, my kids and my grandchildren, um, we're in a safe neighborhood, I feel. Um, and I'd like to Georgetown to continue that way. Um, but I also understand that my needs are not always the needs of a younger generation. And with that, considering that um, as Georgetown grows, we need to consider the younger generation also. And um, I have an email. I, you can call me. Uh, my phone number is probably everyone has it. Um, it's a personal phone number. Uh, but. I, I thank you all, and I respectfully ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you both very much. All right, welcome, Jason and Kevin, um, our city council candidates for District 5. Um, we will start with Jason, and we would love to hear just a quick two-minute introduction of yourself for our audience. Absolutely, and I'd love to give it. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, 
Uh, my name is Jason Norwood. I'm the son of Dr. John R. Norwood and the son of Tanya Norwood. The reason I mention them is because my father's a minister and he is the one who set about creating the person that you see before you, along with my mother, who was a social worker for the majority of my life. Um, they gave me the understanding of what service was. And so I used that understanding to then go be a graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point, commonly referred to as West Point. <laughs> I'm a veteran of the Operation in Iraqi Freedom. Um, I've been a director at several different levels, um, a commander at three different occasions at two different installations. I am sitting on here, the Citizens Advisory Council for the School Board, uh, for School Bond, excuse me. Um, I am extremely biased, but have two of the most beautiful women in the world as my daughters, and I'm married to one of the most wonderful women in the world, my wife, who is a part of the president of McCoy PTA, treasurer for Forbes PTA, and on GISD PTA Council. Um, I'm director, like I said, of a nonprofit that works in Colleen. Um, I'm a small business owner and a partner of a small business that's here in Georgetown and has been for quite some time. I actually just got here after supervising a CPS visitation. Um, so I'm very much involved in making the world or trying to make the world a better place one individual at a time. I'm an, also a graduate student in a master's program in counseling at Texas A&M. I am here for honor, accountability, and transparency. It is that simple. The why of why I do anything is honestly my two daughters. It's the reason I'm still alive. It's the reason I wake up every morning and I take a breath of air, God giving me that opportunity. Um, but the reality is, is that I need to bring that transparency to our operations here because it hasn't been and that's my job. Representative democracy only works if your representatives take your needs and make them their own. That's what I will do. Thank you, Kevin. Well, thank, thank you. First, I'd like to thank Jason for his service. It wasn't for folks like yourself, we wouldn't be able to be here today. So thank, thank you. Thank you for paying your taxes. <laughs> <laughs> well, my name is Kevin Pitts. I'm the current Georgetown City Council member for District 5. I'm also the mayor pro tem. Uh, I am uh, married to my wife, Megan. I have two daughters, Harper and Everly, seven and four. Uh, and uh, Harper is at McCoy, uh, probably with Jason's daughter. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we moved here in 2013. I started working here in Georgetown in 2011. I commuted from Temple uh, back and forth for two years prior to, prior to buying a home here and moving here. And once I moved here, started working at the bank, I pretty much just said yes to everything. Yeah, if there was a board I could get on, I said yes to it. If there was an event going on, I said yes to it. I joined Rotary. I got on the chamber board. I, I chaired the chamber golf tournament. I eventually got on the planning and zoning commission and the zoning board of adjustments. And uh, I still haven't heard, learned the word no, even though I've been told that that's a very important word to learn, learn but I, I, uh, I'm still working on that. After attending the uh, leadership program here with the chamber, I learned more about the city, how things work, how to get involved, and I wanted to have an impact on the city. I wanted to be involved and make sure that whenever my daughters were older, they could look back and know that it was important what I did and that it was important that they do exactly those types of things and get involved in the community and you help your neighbors, you help the community. And so at the leadership program, at the very last day of graduation, you're required to give a commitment. What are you gonna be, you went through this whole program, what are you gonna commit to do now? What are you gonna do to make the community better? Uh, I made two commitments. One was to, uh, I wanted to get on the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce board, which happened about uh, two months later. And uh, the other was to run for Georgetown City Council at some point. And uh, in 2018, I, I hit that goal. I made the commitment, and I believe it was 13 is when I graduated. And uh, I ran in 2018. I was unopposed, and I've been on now for, for three years. I've enjoyed my time. I look forward to serving another three years. And uh, I'd ask for your vote on May 1st, or early voting starts April 19th. Thank you both very much. Um, as I've done with the other candidates, we'll alternate uh, who starts the question, but you'll both answer the same question. Uh, starting with you, of course, Jason. Uh, what is your ideal vision for the future of economic development in Georgetown? So Georgetown is getting bigger, and, and I think that that's a good thing. I think we all agree that that's a good thing, but the economic development cannot outpace the people. Um, when I was a, back when I was a cadet at West Point, they teach you that the commission officers are to worry about the mission and the non commission officers are worried about people. But I often came to the conclusion that without the people, the mission is impossible. So the economic development of Georgetown needs to be tied to a program that allows 
cares for the individuals, cares for the people, and provides the things that they need, like attainable housing, like an education system that is operable and, and maximized for the children of the area for those kids, like a program for parks and recreation that does those types of things. That's my idea of economic development. I have a small business, and so I want to see that business grow, but I cannot see it grow at the expense of an individual. Kevin, your vision, please, for the future of economic development in Georgetown. Well, I, my vision of economic development is to have what's really going to end up being an unobtainable goal, but I would love for every resident of Georgetown to be able to work in Georgetown and not have to drive south out there to uh, Austin, be stuck in traffic. We have, uh, this past year, we did a groundbreaking for our first major industrial park that will have 100, I believe it's uh, first rounds, $98 million in investment just from one of the most, the, the very first building that's going to be built. So there'll be a number of employees over there. They, they haven't given us the exact number because they're not sure who all is going to occupy the buildings. But in my time on council, I've supported projects uh, that we've had $68 million just this past year, excuse me, $68 million in private investment and created over 700 jobs in Georgetown. I continue to, uh, I plan to continue to support projects such as that and try to continue to build more jobs, create more jobs here in Georgetown so residents in Georgetown can work and live in Georgetown. Thank you. Um, going first to you on this one, Kevin, a council member, member is elected by the voters of their district, but each district also has businesses who employ our citizens, provide sales tax to the city and pay taxes. How do you envision balancing the interests of citizens with the businesses in your district? Since I've been elected, I've treated every resident, whether they're a district five resident or a district, you name it, resident the same. Uh, if they reach out to me, I try to help them. And uh, you can see that it's, it's out there for you to see on uh, during the storm. I had plenty of people in the southeast part of Georgetown reaching out to me, needing help. And I, I was helping those folks. The businesses, I've just recently started trying to do a new series with a, with a council update. Uh, and I'd bounce around the different businesses to promote those businesses. I've, uh, I've helped the businesses downtown get outdoor seating so that way they can expand their capacity during COVID-19. During the, uh, the Atmos gas leak, we helped uh, relieve some of the, the policies on the signage to help the businesses down there. So I think my track record speaks for itself on how I represent the cities, the businesses, along with the re all residents of uh, the city of Georgetown. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, question to you, Jason. How do you envision balancing the interests of citizens of your district with the businesses within your district? So thank you, and I believe I alluded to that answer a little bit earlier. Uh, one of the reasons that I'm running is because I reached out to the city council and I, and I was not responded to. And so one of the first things that I did was when I started running was put my phone number out there. It's for everybody to reach 254-419-9371. You can give me a call. That's how dedicated I am to the people of this area because I believe in service. Similarly, as a person who works in, with small business, it is incredibly important to me that businesses thrive. Um, we are part of a, I work with my old first sergeant from when I was uh, in command. Uh, it is it is dire for our families that our businesses thrive. So I believe that it is very easy if you have the time, wherewithal and the care to balance the issues between families, individuals and businesses, if you're willing to make the time to communicate and put all of their priorities out in front. And that's what I do. Thank you, um, Jason. Continuing on questions about business, what's the biggest concern you've heard from businesses and how do you plan to address those? One of the businesses, one of the biggest concerns rather that I've heard from businesses is really, and I'm happy we get into this to get into the mobility bond is access mobility, people being able to get around. Um, I know for my business that that is has preferential treatment when there's foot traffic in that area. That's a very big concern to us as well. The ability to move around Georgetown to see all of the businesses, things like that. Um, we are fortunate enough to not have uh, an overwhelming tax burden um, at our business location. Georgetown doesn't have overwhelmingly high taxes and that's good too uh, for businesses, but the, the ability to get out and have people be known about your business and be able to get to your business is a significant concern. It's one of the reasons that I uh, happen to, to, to be in support of the bond, but we'll definitely get to that question later. 
Kevin, what is the biggest concern you've heard from businesses? How do you plan to address those concerns? Yeah, I think that it varies based on where the business is. So there are some businesses that have issues with parking, like downtown, for example. Uh, Wolf Ranch businesses don't have those same type of issues. There's a very large parking lot there for, for their patrons to park in. Uh, obviously, the folks on Williams Drive, one of their major issues in recent the recent past was the Atmos gas leak. You know, that was devastating to many of those businesses. They were closed. They couldn't even go into their buildings. Uh, then obviously COVID-19 has created other concerns. Uh, all of those issues are issues that I have advocated to find solutions for them. I already mentioned that outdoor downtown seating. I've already mentioned the, uh, the um, uh, gas leak on Williams and some of the things that the city did. And uh, when it comes to the downtown parking, we've got a question. You asked the last candidates, I don't know if you'll ask us, but I was an advocate for the parking garage at the time, and, and I'm still an advocate to try to get more parking downtown to keep people out of the neighborhoods and to help people get down to our downtown square and spend money with our local businesses. Uh, going in another direction, Kevin, what is your vision for public transportation in Georgetown? I would say right now my vision for public transportation is there's not a, any public transportation in Georgetown. We have a GoGeo bus system. I don't believe it will be, uh, I don't believe we'll have it much longer. If uh, anybody in this room just pays attention to the bus driving by, there's usually at least one person in the bus and it's the driver. Every now and then there's another person in there with them. Uh, the bus system has, has not hit any of the benchmarks that were originally set by it. It was supposed to be a three-year program and then review it after that. It's been reviewed, it's not been successful. Uh, governmental programs don't need to last in perpetuity. If they do not work, we need to kill it. We need to put the money back to the taxpayers to spend it on something that is needed, which obviously a public transit system is not needed now because it's not been successful and, and it appears no one's riding it. And, and uh, Or we need to give the money back to the taxpayers through uh, lowering taxes. Thank you, Jason. What is your vision for public transportation in Georgetown? Thank you for that question. My issue with the fact that I concur that currently public transportation in Georgetown is not being utilized, but that would bring me to the question of why. I, I was medically retired as a major in the United States Army, and anybody will tell you majors are planners. We plan. I planned at the core level four different installations together. I think that the reason that the public transportation didn't work in Georgetown is because it wasn't planned properly. We need to do a much better job of planning. And that's one of the things that I excel at because it was forced down my throat to excel at it. I had to for people to survive and they did. And so I became good at it. And that's really what we need to do when it comes to the public transportation system in Georgetown. We need to look at it better and we need to plan it. My mother-in-law now lives in Georgetown. She doesn't like to drive at night. I want her to be able to utilize public transportation if it could be available, but we need to plan it better so that it meets the needs of the people that use it. There's no other reason to have it. Thank you. Jason, you uh, mentioned the mobility bond, and we're not going to uh, specifically address that, but over the coming years, there are going to be multiple infrastructure projects throughout the community. Um, those projects are going to impact businesses. How do you plan to work with contractors and city staff to ensure the businesses don't have another unnecessary burden on their operations? Communication, communication, communication. I am currently in a master's program for counseling. One of the big things that goes with counseling is being able to communicate, being able to listen. The reason I put out my phone number is because I want people to call me. I want to listen. I want to hear what the problems are. I want to be able to not only have a bird's eye view of what's going on when infrastructure plans are being executed, but be able to get down to what we would call an army, the tactical level, and see exactly why that dumpster is blocking the entrance for the parking lot for that uh, for those businesses over there. Let's move that. Can we do something about that? Call me. I'll make it happen. Uh, my wife will tell you, I, I don't sleep much. Um, so I have the time, the wherewithal and the bandwidth to make those conversations, to have that communication and to go out and make those changes. Communication is how we fix that problem. I'm a communicator. Thank you, Kevin. Same question to you. How do you plan to work with contractors and city staff to ensure businesses don't have another unnecessary burden on their operation from the uh, infrastructure projects? 
Well, the first part of this question is uh, really about the role of a council member. It's not the role of a council member to work with contractors who the city contracts with to do jobs. So I won't be doing anything with contractors because that's not within my role. What is within my role is to set the budget in the city of Georgetown, which includes our capital improvements. Uh, we have what's called a five-year CIP plan, capital improvement plan, that will we program in improvements over that five-year period. So one thing that we could do to make sure no one has an undue burden is to ensure that we're not putting all of the projects in one area in any given year or rep repeatedly, repeatedly, excuse me. So for example, a great example was discussed quite a bit during the road bond discussion or the transportation bond discussion uh, was the Austin Avenue bridges. So right now, COVID-19, the pandemic, people are trying to recover still from that, uh, putting out, making the bridge one lane each way could hurt people getting downtown or slow people from coming downtown, which could hurt our businesses. So we need to make sure we're programming our capital improvements equitably across the city. So that way no business is uh, just getting hit over and over with those. Thank you very much. Um, question comes to you, Kevin. The Chamber of Commerce surveyed our members and 80% of those surveyed agreed or strongly agreed that government should avoid action that unnecessarily raises the cost of housing so that our housing is as obtainable as possible for the community's workforce. Based on these results, how can local government avoid action that unnecessarily raises the cost of housing? Well, unnecessarily is a uh, relative word, so it's hard to say what is necessary and what is unnecessary. We just passed transportation impact fees. Uh, the second reading was uh, two nights ago. What is tonight? Tonight, Wednesday? Tonight's Thursday. Tonight's Thursday. Two nights ago, we passed tra traffic impact fees, so developers on future developments will pay in a fee that will go into a fund that will then improve roads or build new roads in certain areas, depending upon where the development is. So I guess I would have to ask back, I know you're not answering questions, was that a necessary fee? Because that will definitely increase the cost of housing. So we have to determine, it, it's hard to say what is necessary and what is unnecessary, but we must be cognizant on the city council if we are concerned with affordability, that all fees that we raise, all fees we create, all, the, all of those fees are ultimately paid by the, the homeowner and ultimately increase the cost of housing. So if it's something that we feel is 100% necessary, then, then let's go with it, but uh, we'll have that debate on the dais. So unnecessary, once again, is a relative term, so that's a very difficult question to answer there. Jason, your thoughts on how local government can avoid action that unnecessarily raises the house cost of housing? I was very successful and have been very successful in my career up to this point. And one of the ways in which I became successful was by not assuming I'm the smartest person in the room. I said that to say this, I just got off the phone about two days ago with the housing, uh, the housing building association in Northern Austin. And I asked them that very same question. And they came back to me with the manner in which we have some of our requirements inside of uh, developed agents, developed areas, and how that then passes on expenses and costs to the home builder that are then passed on to the home buyer. We need to look at housing, and I've talked to a, a gentleman who runs a program to look at affordable and attainable housing in Georgetown. Again, because I want to be, I want to have the smartest people in the room around me. We need to look at, at housing in a manner in which we provide, a, a, a deregulation is often the overused term, but a manner which that provides the builder the opportunity to provide housing at the lowest possible expense. So the person buying it can get it at the lowest possible expense. And I think we have a lot of things that are unnecessarily attached to our cross now. Okay, final question comes to you first, uh, Jason. What does preserve Georgetown mean to you? And how would you activate that if you were elected? So Preserve Georgetown, I'm really happy you mentioned this. I went to a school, my high school graduated a class of 217. By the time my oldest, my younger brother graduated 10 years later, the class was 800. That is the growth that Georgetown is looking at. Planning is your answer, by the way. Planning, planning, planning. Growth is happening. We're not going to stop. And I don't really think anybody wants to stop it per se, but we need to plan to get ahead of it so that like at my hometown school, we don't have trailers outside of the high school. We've already planned on how 
to deal with that growth. Growth can be a great thing, right? Especially for small businesses. We want people with expendable income to come and utilize our services and businesses. That's great, but we have to plan. Planning and communication is the answer how we keep Georgetown, Georgetown. That's one of the reasons I moved here. It's one of the reasons I was sold on this place. And that's one of the things that I will make sure maintains. Thank you, Kevin. What does preserve Georgetown mean to you? I think most people think of the, the small town charm as something that we see in our, our uh, citizen survey. And so the traffic's one of the biggest things that, that people complain about that makes them feel like it's not Georgetown anymore. Having to sit through a red light multiple times, having to sit on 29, having to dodge traffic at Chick-fil-A parking lot, which is not a city road, by the way, that's their private property parking lot. But the uh, one thing we need to do is if we can expand our infrastructure into areas that can handle the traffic, for example, 195, 130, up 35 in some, some areas. If we have water and wastewater in those areas, then development will move to those areas. Right now, why do people keep building down 29, down Williams Drive, down Leander Road? That's where the infrastructure is. That's why. So if we can find ways to free up money within our budget, if we can find ways to uh, recruit good businesses here or development here that will help pay for the extension of those utilities. That will take the stress off of the roads and the, uh, the infrastructure that we currently have, which will make people feel like they're still in a small town Georgetown. Very good, thank you. And uh, that brings us to our final minute. And Kevin, I'm gonna have you go first with your um, final comments. Well, thank you. Th thank you for having me and thank you everyone who came. Uh, you know. I've enjoyed my first term on council. I don't know what's wrong with me. People always ask, why, why do you do that? It's a thankless job. And uh, I don't know, I tell them, I, I can't really tell you, I must have something wrong with me because I haven't, I have enjoyed it. Uh, I've, I've figured out, you know, there's one thing that's really important on council. And that's how do you get three other people to agree with you? If you wanna get anything done, doesn't matter what you wanna do, doesn't matter. If three other people don't agree with you, you ain't getting it done. But then even more important than that is you gotta get whatever that is you wanna get done has to show up on an agenda. It doesn't just magically show up there. You can't do it on your own. You have to have at least one other person to put an item on the agenda, but it's gotta be up for a vote for it can ever actually be, be done. In my three years on council this past, this, uh, this first term, I've illustrated the ability to not only get items that are important to me on the agenda, but also to get them passed. And so if you live in district five, if you wanna to continue to have an effective council member who gets stuff done, you need to vote for me on May 1st. Thank you and final comments to you, Jason. Thank you so much. I'll stand for this. I really appreciate the opportunity that everybody's given me to be here. I really appreciate everybody for coming. Uh, the be all and end all is that I am a leader of teams. I've shown that over my life and I've dedicated my service to not just my country, but my community. My family has been about that for the entire existence of, of us as a family as well. I say all that to say this. I want to communicate with the people of District 5, and I want to win their vote because they know that I will work for them. I'm going to work. I'm going to be a public servant. That's what I would, God put me here to do that. Um, but I want to be a public servant for you because I know that I can communicate. I know that I can make people, I shouldn't say make anybody, but I can convince people to be on my side and to, to come to consensus about things that are just smart decisions for our community. That's the only reason that I'm here. That's the reason that I wanna be your district representative. And that's why you should vote for me on May 1st. I thank everyone for the opportunity. God bless you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much, Jason and Kevin. And thank you to all of our candidates and to our audience for some wonderful questions and for your full attention.